Facebook Live if you like. Um, great to have you here if you're checking us out on Facebook Live, Risen Church, Glenn Honberg, uh, looking at um, God Saved Us. Let me just set up the screen share again. Here we go. So being uh, fit for God's purpose. And here's our theme, Jesus saved us for good. Jesus saved us for good. Well, uh, I was looking up the word mercy online and I came across an online dictionary and it had the uh, top 10 uh, words that people look up there. And the first one was pretentious. Uh, uh, you know, people, people use it to sound self-important, that word. Uh, ubiquitous was another one that uh, was top 10 words looked up. Um, you know, people just want to use that word everywhere, even though they don't know what it means. And apathetic. I meant to look up the meaning for that, but I just couldn't have been bothered. But according to this online dictionary, one of the things that's interesting is that one of the top 10% of words that people look up is the word mercy. The word mercy. Um, Think about that. Could you, could you give a quick definition of mercy? Just take a second. Could you give a definition of mercy? Maybe you could say that to the person sitting on the couch next to you, what your definition is. <laughs> mercy. Uh, here's one definition that came up. Uh, mercy is showing a love or kindness to human need in an unexpected way. Oh, I like that. I like that. What do you think? Here's another one. I think it's a little bit closer to the Bible's definition. Mercy is compassion that does not punish even when justice demands it. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Mercy is compassion and you could, that does not punish even when justice demands it. That is hitting what the Bible's on about with mercy. God's mercy is a compassion that does not punish even when justice demands it, but instead shows incredible goodness to us. And that's what we're going to look at today. Um, we're going to look at three things um, from Titus, that God saved us, that the Holy Spirit washed us, and that Jesus justifies us. And um, the us there is talking about Christians. But this offer of mercy is available to everyone who responds to this message. Um, so let's look at that first one. Um, God saved us. I'm going to share my screen. God saved us. God saved us. Look with me at verse 4. It says this, But the loving kindness, but when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us. Um, it's to, that word appeared there, we met it in Titus chapter 2, and it's about the coming of Jesus. So God's character was actually always loving and always kind. That's partly why we looked at Exodus 34. It's always been who God is. But when Jesus came, Christmas 2,000 years ago, at the incarnation, when Jesus was born into humanity, fully God, but fully man as well, the kindness and love of God appeared. It was manifest. It was made shown. It was displayed. And what did God do? Well, verse 4 continues on to verse 5. He saved us. He saved us. It's towards the end of the letter of Titus, and it's just a summary statement. What a great summary statement from the Bible. This is one of those verses, kind of 4 through to 7, that uh, 4 through to 8, is just worth knowing and learning, um, not just the kids who are singing the song, but us. But God saved us. But then you notice the next thing that's said there. Not. <laughs> not because of the righteous things we had done, or not because of the works we had done. See, not's a really important word, isn't it? Um, uh, not rules things out. It says this is not the case. It excludes things out. Um, when someone's going for a driving test, you want the driving instructor to say, that's not how you drive for the sake of everyone else. Um, no's rule things out. Now, if this was a Venn diagram to do with salvation, you know, Venn diagrams are those circles. And then um, the question is, what saved us? Um, there's God and there's us. And then... What this passage is saying, in the circle called us, there's nothing in that circle. There's not our deeds or our works, our actions that saved us. See, sometimes I think we think we're worth saving. Uh, it might be uh, religious acts. I go to church regularly. I read the Bible. I pray to you, God. Um, I think, therefore, I'm, I'm worth saving. I'm a good Christian person. But this is saying not by anything we do. 
not even religious things. Or we might be moralistic. I, I rescued a pet dog. And you know, it's really hard to actually rescue a pet dog. We've been trying to get one. We don't meet the bar. We are too low as a family to get a pet dog so far. We, we, don't, we, we don't cut the mustard so far, but perhaps someone will have mercy on us. Um, maybe you rescued a pet dog. Uh, maybe you've helped the old ladies across the street. Uh, maybe you've given to all sorts of funds and charities. And that's kind of your moral effort. But the Bible's saying here, in the circle of salvation, that don't, that's not what saves us. The category of religion or moralism doesn't save us. And if you think um, being religion or moralism does save us, I put it to you that you have a very superficial and naive understanding of humanity. Because actually look a little bit more closely at who we are. See, that's the... That, that's, um, when, they, when, when, when novelists write books, as you know, they always write characters who are flawed. Why is that? Well, because if you write an unflawed character... They're not a real character. Are they? They're not human. And that's the point. Um, it doesn't justify humanity, but actually says we're profoundly a mixed bag, a profound mixed bag. Look at verse uh, chapter 3, verse 3, if you've got Titus open. It's um, pretty harsh language here. It says we are deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Deceived and enslaved. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Doesn't it describe you and me? Um, haven't you done things that you thought you would like or you thought that would be good and actually you were self-deceived? They did not turn out to be good for you or good for other people. But then you found yourself, what, enslaved to them, unable to stop. You've done ugly, awful things and yet you stay trapped in them and you can't seem to break out and you just keep giving in to them again and again and again. Isn't that you? <laughs> Isn't that me? Verse 3 and then it says, we lived in malice and envy, hate, being hated and hating one another. Um, not every person on the island of Crete was like this, right? <laughs> not, but he's saying, this is the default for humanity. Uh, not all of us in all the same way. But have you, I'm sure you felt envy. Envy is like when someone else has some kind of success or win in life, and we wish that they did not get it. We resent them for getting it. And we, we put on a brave face and we clap with the cloud. Bravo, bravo. But deep in our heart, we think, that should be me. I am better than them. In my case, better looking. And foolish. We say in our hearts, there is no God. Some of us think that directly. But some of us just practical atheists. We live as if this is true. That there is no God. The Bible paints a pretty dark picture of us here. And the problem is, um, it's how we act and how we think. It, it's not just what we do, it's the deep attitudes in our heart. That's where the, the envy and the malice, that's where they spring from. And, and there's, a double, there's a double problem here. It says we are victims, enslaved and deceived. We can't save ourselves. <laughs> we, we're victims. Someone, uh, we're, we're trapped in this. We can't save ourselves. Salvation can't be from us because we're enslaved and deceived but we're also responsible we're also responsible foolish and disobedient we put ourselves in the situation do you remember the, the venn diagram of salvation um even when we do good or right things they are deeply and profoundly tainted so when it can't there's nothing in us that means we can save ourselves or makes us really worthy of salvation um, I know this is hard to hear. Um, Western culture is all about self-esteem and self-image. And, and we, we pretend that there's something worth saving in ourselves and that we're good. But then we, we, we fall into this problem of a desperate search to see and sustain this self-image and this self-esteem by looking to ourselves. And it doesn't work and it leads to darkness and despair. But the Christian message is God saved us. God saved us. And this, when it comes to salvation, is the second part of the Venn diagram. It's all because of God. Um, it says, you can see there in the passage, he saved us, not because, verse 5, the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. It is God's amazing, wonderful, incredible mercy. It is his character. It's not by accident or weakness, but with intentionality and strength. 
And the source of salvation is centered in God himself as the merciful one. It's a message that lets us stop pretending and stop despairing. Mercy is compassion that does not punish even when justice demands it, but brings good instead. That's what this picture is. God is merciful. We are enslaved and deceived and we hate and we've been hated and we've fallen into this trap and we live in it and we're responsible and we're victims and there's nothing really in us. Even the good works we do are profoundly tainted, but instead God brings his mercy to bear. He brings his compassion to bear and he does not punish even when justice demands it, but instead he brings goodness. Well, how much mercy is there in God? One old writer said this, God's mercy is so great that it is easier to drain the sea of its water or deprive the sun of its light or make the universe too narrow than diminish the great mercy of God. God saved us. God saved Christians. It's God's work. It's God's work. But there's more. That was the first point. The next point is that the Holy Spirit washed us. He's wrapped. God saved us on the screen there. If you're on Zoom, the Holy Spirit washed us. The Holy Spirit washed us. Um, washing by the Holy Spirit. Um, it's tempting when I know about you, when I think of the word washing, I think of a dish rag and a cloth or a washcloth on your face. But a better image here is to think of a waterfall. It's stepping into a waterfall. And when you step into a waterfall, even a small waterfall, boy, are you washed, aren't you? The water just pounds over you. There's not one square millimeter of you that's missed by the water. It just covers you and consumes you. So a better word maybe is here is the word bathed. That's the background perhaps word. Um, he says, bathed by the Holy Spirit, completely immersed by the Holy Spirit. Um, some people think that there's kind of um, serious kind of word Christians and then there's spirit Christians. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, there's only one kind of Christian, a Holy Spirit kind of Christian. Um, anyone who wants to separate those things, um, they, they just don't understand Christianity. Um, there's only one kind of Christian, it's the Holy Spirit kind of Christian. Now, what about people who call themselves Christian but don't seem to live by the Spirit? Well, the problem might not be that they're not a Holy Spirit Christian. The problem is more likely that they're not actually Christian. So what kind of clean is this? Washing by the Holy Spirit, being completely immersed in the Holy Spirit. It's the best sparkle in the universe. It's a cosmic sparkle. Um, it's a sparkle of birth and renewal. Look at verse 5. He says, it's the bathing, it's bathing, the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Um, the rebirth there. To be reborn. Um, we were dead in evil and sin and then we were reborn. We have a new life. But a new life ready for a new age. See, this, this is big. This is cosmic. Um, the other time that this word is used, this rebirth word, is used by Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus uses it to talk about the new age that is coming. The cosmic rebirth of creation, seen and unseen. The heavens and the earth renewed. So God's plan is this cosmic rebirth, a new creation in a new age. And through the Holy Spirit, a person is bathed, reborn again, ready for the new age. So it's not so much just about a change in us. It's about what God is doing in the whole universe and we are caught up in it. That's, that's a pretty massive washing. But what about the bathing of renew, to renew something? Well, when you come back uh, from a holiday uh, a long time ago before COVID-19, Someone asks, how was your holiday? And you say, I've been renewed. I'm not what I was. I'm new. I'm better. Um, renewal is better than restoration. Restoration takes something back to what it was. To renew is to make something new or better. A renovation project. And this is all by the Holy Spirit. When someone becomes a Christian, when they trust in Jesus, the thundering waterfall of the Holy Spirit falls on them and they are reborn ready for the new age, and they are renewed. Wow, what a wonderful picture. If you trusted in Jesus, God's Spirit has come upon you. You have been reborn, ready for the new age, and you have been renewed. Looking forward to your complete renewal. And this is only because of Jesus. Uh, look at the next bit there. Uh, let me share the screen again. 
God saved us. The Holy Spirit washed us. Oops. Jesus justifies us. Jesus justifies us. Verse 6. Verse 6. When he poured out on us, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace. Um, justification is the legal word there. It's talking about this. Holy Spirit came through Jesus. There's only one avenue to us um, of the Holy Spirit. It comes through Jesus. It's only when you trust in Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. You don't get it any other way, but when you trust him, you get it, as I said before. Okay, but how does that work? Well, you've been justified by his grace. Uh, justification is a legal term. It's to be declared right with God and therefore to be declared not guilty. If you've been justified, you've been declared not guilty. If we've been justified, we've been declared not guilty of the wrong we've done. How? Well, by God's grace. Paul cannot let it go. Do you notice he talks about, verse 4, God's mercy, his generosity. Here it's having been justified by his grace. It's his love that saves us. Um, think of the Venn diagram again. He's saying uh, when it comes to salvation, and we're exploring that, we think that there's some overlap. There's something in us that overlaps with why God might save us. And Paul's like, no, there's nothing in us that saves us. It's over to the side, but it's all in God. It's his mercy. It's his kindness. It's his love, if this is the circle of salvation. It's his goodness. And he did it through Jesus' death. That's what justifies us, declares us not guilty. Let me say it sharply. There is no thing a Christian contributes to us being acquitted and declared not guilty. There is no thing that helped us be acquitted and declared not guilty. Um, in the courtroom of heaven, think, there's a poor, lonely, miserable cretin. And he stands before the eternal, holy God. There is no thing in that cretin that makes him worthy of being rescued. There is no thing this cretin has done that makes them worthy of being saved. Instead, there are many things in this cretin, hence their name, that means the verdict guilty of wrongdoing is the right verdict. And it ought to be declared by God. It ought to boom out from the throne of God and the cretin taken to his doom. But instead, instead, this is saying in the courtroom of heaven, the words that come out from the throne of God are, I declare this cretin not guilty. I declare this cretin not guilty. If you are a Christian, <laughs> you've trusted in Jesus, you are a cretin who has been declared not guilty. There's a definition for you to share with your friends. What's a Christian? A cretin who's been declared not guilty. And now because of this, because of Jesus, and by his work through the Holy Spirit, you have been reborn and renewed. You no longer are a cretin. You are now a Christian, a new person in God. How is this possible? The life and death of Jesus for us. Now, this is amazing, right? Because it means even when you fail as a Christian, you stand acquitted. Because it, it depends on the salvation and the mercy found in God. You stand acquitted as long as you hold on to Jesus. The good works that you did didn't save you in the first place. And when you fail in goodness, they're not, that doesn't condemn you. The salvation is still only in God. It's what saved you in the first place and it's what keep you, keeps you saved as a Christian. A Christian isn't saved by their good works. A Christian doesn't stay saved by their good works. It's God's good work in Jesus. But God isn't finished yet. Look at the next idea in that verse. It's amazing. Having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. I follow the movement here from verse 3 through to verse 6. It's incredible. We were what? Foolish and disobedient, hated and hating. And then bathe, washed by the Holy Spirit um, to, to rebirth and renewal through the death of Jesus, which overturned our guilty verdict, so that, verse 7, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Who are the heirs? Heirs who receive a kingdom. It's, heir, it, it's sons and daughters who receive an inheritance. He's saying cretins have become Christians, and Christians are sons and daughters of God himself who will inherit eternal life, life with God. No president, no king, no ruler, no CEO, no financial tycoon has more 
than the lowliest Christian. All that the great leaders and rulers of the world have is nothing compared to what the weakest and most fragile Christian has in Jesus. Eternal life in God. Now we're almost finished, but let me bring us to something that's really important to see here. Do you see here that God our Saviour, the thing about God our Saviour, that the Christian faith is a Trinitarian faith? Did you notice that on the way through? It's a profoundly Trinitarian faith. Verse 4, But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, He saved us, referring to the Father, right? Rebirth and renewal, how? By the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Through Jesus Christ our Saviour. And notice again that verse 4, the kindness and love of God our Saviour, and verse 6 is Jesus Christ our Saviour. There's no gap here. Um, but Jesus is called the Saviour, just as God the Father is called the Saviour. And then verse 8, it says, all those who've trusted God. The great act of salvation, the Father's eternal will, brings rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. And this is the work of the one God himself. What's the Trinity? Let me share my screen with you. Share my screen, not scare my screen. The Trinity. God is one in essence. There is one God, but three persons. God is one, but three persons. Different roles. The Father, the Holy Spirit, the Son, Jesus. Different roles, but all working together. And, and it's important to distinguish between the roles and their personhood, but they're not separate. Um, let me share with you two wrong views very quickly. <laughs> Two wrong views of the Trinity. God is one. God is one entity who appears in three different appearances. That God appears as Father. And then sometimes he comes to us as the Son. And sometimes he comes to us as the Holy Spirit. Um, these are like the modes of God. This is a wrong view. It's, it's like water can be um, steam. Or water can be liquid. Or water can be frozen and be solid. Um, and this, the one water is, it has three different you know, forms. But that's not what the Trinity is. That's a wrong view. Why is it wrong? Well, actually then, God is deceptive. <laughs> and, 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 and when we're dealing with Jesus, is this truly who God is? When the Holy Spirit comes on, is this truly who God is? God is kind of switching around. Um, it also doesn't make sense of lots of the New Testament where Jesus prays to the Father. Um, what's going on there? Um, when Jesus says, I'll send another counsel, the Holy Spirit. No, it just doesn't make any sense. That's one wrong view. The second wrong view is that God is three persons, but there's no unity. Tritheism. Right. There's three gods. The thing to remember when you think about the Trinity is uh, God is one in essence, but three persons. But we've got to think about the connected. Here's a, um, right, let me share a slide again. This is Gregory of Nazianzus when they were sorting this out a few, oh, 15, oh, 1800 years ago. Here it is. Gregory of Nazianzus. Here's a quote. No sooner do I conceive of the one, Son, Holy Spirit of the Father, than I am illumined by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one. No, sorry, I read that out. I got it wrong, didn't I? No sooner do I conceive of the one, the one true God, than I am loomed by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one. God is one in essence, but three persons. I'll, I'll share that um, later on Facebook and a few other places. Uh, if you want to see this in Jesus' own words, check out Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. Uh, the Trinity is a doctrine um, not just imposed on the Scriptures. It's in Jesus himself. Jesus himself speaks of this. He hasn't used the word Trinity, but it's there. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. There's huge implications from this. Uh, we don't really have time to go into it now. We don't have time to go into the implications. I might share them on some email. But here it is. Uh, we lose a lot when we lose the the, uh, the Trinitarian view of God. The Christian faith is a Trinitarian faith. Um, how can God be three and one and one be three? God is a complex unity. You know, light is a complex unity. Light is both a wave and a particle. We've known about it for decades and decades. And we're not sure how it's true that light acts when you test for it as a particle. It works as a particle. When you test for it as a wave, it acts as a wave. Scientists don't really know yet. Maybe they'll work it out one day. But how? Light is both a wave and a particle. Light is a complex unity. And we're humbled by that. We need to recognize there's limits to our understanding. How God is both one and three, but the scriptures affirm it. Well, we've come to the end. But what is all this salvation about? 
or verse 8, Jesus saved us for good. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. What he means is every person in the church, from the smallest child to the oldest member, men and women. This is a trustworthy saying. I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. That's a challenge, isn't it? Are you being careful, if you're a Christian believer, to devote yourself to doing what is good? Or is doing good something that's more haphazard than just when you get the opportunity? There's a carefulness, there's a seriousness, there's an intentionality here. And the word devotion kind of elevates this. You're devoted. It's, it's like a fitness regime in the 21st century. Most of us are pretty devoted to our fitness regimes. But Paul's saying, actually, the call on the Christian is to be devoted to doing good in the world, good to our community, good in our workplace, good to our friends and neighbors, good to other believers, good to those who don't believe. See, and Titus, this is, fun, this is a fundamental part of the Christian um, faith. It's a response. It's not the goodness saves us. But it is what God expects of those who are his people. See, Titus is to do what? Well, he's to stress these things. He's to lay it out. He's to challenge people. He's to push them on it. How are you going at being devoted, if you are a believer, a Christian believer, to doing what is good? Well, let me conclude very simply. Every cretin who trusts Jesus will be saved because of God's mercy. And not, not because of anything in themselves. Every cretin can become a Christian. And those who've become Christian, God wants you to do good in the world. Thanks for listening on uh, Facebook. Uh, we're going to resume as a church with our prayers together.